So today we begin uh, this new series. As you can see, it's going to take us all the way to Advent. We've been planning this for probably a year or more. And I believe it's going to be a historic season in the life of our church. Hey, when Lori Santos, Dr. Santos of Yale University, saw the severity of depression, anxiety, and, uh, and, and isolation among their, her students, she decided to do something about it. So in 2018, she launched a new class at Yale University uh, on how to be happy. And it became the most popular course in Yale's history over 300 plus years of the university. About a quarter of the students immediately, quarter of the students entered into the course. Well, then the pandemic hit. And she saw that everybody was talking about, you know, evidence-based kind of ways to protect your, your physical health, but nobody knew how to protect our mental health. And then her class became more popular than ever. And, and in the class, she would ask questions like, uh, what is happiness? Uh, what does it mean to be happy? How can we be happy? And implied too, are, are, are you happy? And, and, and so then it became even more and more popular. I understand now it's being taught in high schools. But uh, she said that really at the core of it all is, is we're, we're made happy not by necessarily pursuing certain things that we always think are going to make us happy. We think we need to change our circumstances in order to be happy. She said it's through simple habits, practices on a daily basis that make us happy. Now, my guess is my hunch, just as quick as this course became so popular, it will over time fade in popularity or at least be changed in so many ways. But we do have ancient words that are true and forever true that help guide us as we think about what it is to live the good life. Surprisingly, at least to me, when we came to this title some, about a year ago, um, and you'll discover why, translating the word blessed or blessed, as we see in the Beatitudes, um, the, her class, Psychology 110, psych, it's, it's called, uh, I, think it's, I think it's Psychology and the Good Life. But we know that just like every pursuit of happiness that's come along, come down the pike through the ages, I think this one too will be found wanting and will likely disappear. But the words of Jesus remain. And we find the good life and how he describes the good life in the book of Matthew. So I want you to turn to the book of Matthew. Many of you know that it's in Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 1 through 12. Now, if you're new to church, maybe you've never been to church. Um, I've met some of you who are brand new today. But if, you've never, if you had never set foot in a church, you likely have heard certain phrases like, love your enemies, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Um, love your enemies. Don't store up treasures here on earth, but in heaven. You've heard these phrases, and they're all found in a singular place right here in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus' vision of the world is explicitly taught to us, and he's telling us how we can love God by loving others, all right? So the great command. And, and what we see here is that the good life, happiness, okay, shows up in unexpected places among unexpected people in unexpected ways. What we see here is the kingdom of God. Now, it's been debated among theologians for two millennia and others, what is he really talking about here? And it seems so far out there that some have determined well, it's a spiritual kingdom. Um, no one can attain this. And someday we'll live in this kind of world. But it's very clear that Jesus is saying, no, this is how we're to live right now. This is what we're made for. We're made to live this kind of a life, but for so long, people have not known what to do with the Sermon on the Mount. English author, Christian philosopher, G.K. Chesterton said this, the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. Nowhere is this truer than the Sermon on the Mount. This is going to challenge everything in us as God's people, in your life and mine, and it all starts here with the Beatitudes. So we all have this sense of what the good life might be. Every single one of us. If we attain this, if we get this. North Dallas, North Texas has its own version of the good life. We think, I, you know, you could help me here probably, but it's, it's really around comfort. Maybe that's brought about through affluence, make more money, materialism, 
uh, if I could just have the freedom, uh, individual freedom, to live my life and have the kind of security I want. I think we pursue these things thinking this will be the good life for us. And ironically, what happens is the more we pursue the good life apart from Christ, the more we're pushed away from the good life. And we see this in the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount as well. It's what we've talked about before. It's the paradox of hedonism, which again, is not a Christian thing. It's a philosophical thing that says the pursuit of happiness is not found in pursuing happiness. It's found in pursuing something else. In this case, Jesus says it's found in pursuing something else, the kingdom of God, someone else, the king himself. And so Jesus says it's not found in pursuing happiness. See, happiness the blessed life ensues, it follows. So it comes as a result of pursuing Jesus. And if we could get this into our minds and our hearts and then practice the pursuit of Jesus every single day, I'm believing this will change our church. I know that it will. Every one of you are here because you seek to be a disciple of Jesus. And in the Sermon on the Mount, again, the Beatitudes, we see the posture, the position, the type of people who are living the blessed life, living the good life. Now, with all of us together, we're very intentional here. We know we're moving around with the, the sanctuary uh, being refreshed and all the things. It's been a challenging season, but I just want to say thank you to all of us. We'll be back in a, rather, a more regular rhythm next, the next week and to follow, but it's been a wonderful season. But I want to let you know that for the next, gosh, 12 weeks, we're going to journey together as a church family, and we're going to walk through this. I want to challenge you, don't miss a week. Uh, don't miss one week and invite friends to come and join us. And then you can also join us at the pastor study. That's on Wednesday night. We kicked off all of our girl classes. You can join us uh, for all the great opportunities you have on Wednesday night and come join us for, for a meal and then uh, find a class. But the pastor study, which I'll lead 530 to 630 in the loft right above us, we'll be taking a deep dive into the Beatitudes throughout the entire fall. And I would love to have you come and join us. We're going to um, dive into the Beatitudes in our connect groups. Every connect group is going to walk through the Beatitudes in October. So today we're going to do an all too brief um, take on it. And that's going to kick us off. So the word Beatitudes comes from the Latin uh, beatus, which means blessed. You may say blessed or blessed. When I came to, we came to this title some a year ago or so, I discovered then, and I agree with Dr. Tim Mackey, if you know anything about the Bible Project, he says that that word blessed is actually best translated. The good life belongs to these. The life that is the good life, the best life belongs to these. So here in the Beatitudes, uh, you have it there, Matthew 5, we see three triads, okay, three threes. Um, nine Beatitudes that describe the surprising identity of those who would pursue the kingdom of God here on earth. I want to just read it over you right now. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, interesting, the posture of now the rabbi teaching, his disciples gathered around him. And he opened his mouth and taught them. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Should read sons and daughters of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. What we see then that follows the Beatitudes are what we could call case studies, um, real life situations on how these people, us, how we live in, in this world, how we live this out. 
Now, it's important to note, we always talk about context and who Jesus' audience is here. If you know anything about the history of, uh, of Israel, we, we have some Israelites with us this morning. We have some Palestinian uh, folks among us. So, so what, if you know anything about the history of Israel, um, you know that just prior to Jesus, there were several political social uprisings. Uh, you might know the Maccabean revolt, right about 150 BC. But there is constant revolt and great political and social upheaval. And so during this time, the people that Jesus is speaking to who lived in Palestine were an occupied and oppressed people. They were living constantly with Roman boots on their necks every day. They had no um, cultural power. They had no political power. And Jesus is saying, let me tell you how to live the good life while living under the oppression of the Roman Empire. And, and so what we see then in the, in the New Testament, I've talked about this in July, I preached a sermon about this, but Peter goes on, the early church leaders um, continued this theme we see throughout God's word as as his people living in exile, Peter says to all the churches in exile who are living in exile in, in Babylon. So this became this, this theme. Even John talks about it in Revelation where he says those who are in Babylon. Babylon is the beast. Now they're talking about the Roman Empire. But they're also talking about this, this, um, this, this militaristic prideful empire that will be seen over and over again throughout history and on into Revelation. So in July, when I talked about this, we, we talked about four identities um, that we are living in that then define four storylines that we find ourselves in. We are children. We are disciples. We are exiles. And we are servants. And we'll continue to kind of unpack this as we go along. But how do we live this out? How do we live out these storylines that we're all called to live? Well, Jesus shows us here. We see it explicitly in his life, and we see it uh, taught explicitly through the Sermon on the Mount. This is what kingdom people look like. Now, this is why I believe this message is going to be so critical and historic in the life of our church. Uh, I don't have to tell you, there, there's a few reasons here. The church has lost its way in America in so many ways. Um, secondly, I, I think in this cultural moment of social upheaval, as I noted, um, totalitarian terror uh, globally, we see, we see dysfunctional democracies, frankly. Uh, even some would say here in the United States, giving China, Russia, others, all the fodder they need, all the, the, the press they need to... to, to to say that perhaps liberal democracies are not uh, the better form of government. And, and, and so we, we know we're in this really crazy season, unlike any time in my lifetime, for those of you who are younger, uh, this, you're going, this is wild, and it is. And I don't have to tell you this, we're in an election year. Um, and what we're going to do is, is we're going to live as kingdom people. Because you know this, we look back 2016, we look at 2020, the church did not fare well during that time, having been co-opted by political powers or national or secular uh, movements, and instead of loving our neighbors well, we became a lot like the world. And when we become like the world and lose our countercultural uniqueness, we lose our witness. But we've learned some things. And so the Lord is going to guide us and lead us. We're, these are urgent times. I'm, I'm pastoring and preaching with a great sense of urgency these days. I, I've, I've talked about this in the past, the past 25 years. We've seen the greatest, most dramatic shift, the largest concentrated change in, a, in attendance in American history, in church history, and not for the good. 40 million people who formerly went to church no longer go to church over the past 25 years. A lot of research and study have been done. Demographers and others want to talk about why this is the case. I've got a singular reason, I think, and it's the lack of discipleship, particularly from one generation to the next. The only way out of this declining influence will be for those who claim a Christian identity to become disciples of Jesus. And that is a move that many of us perhaps need to make. Dallas Willard, probably the smartest guy that I've read um, on discipleship, he, he writes this. 
The idea of having faith in Jesus has come to be totally isolated from being his apprentice and learning how to do what he said we should do. Disciples are those seriously intending to become like Jesus from the inside out, systematically and progressively rearrange their affairs to that end. We're to live a life that looks comprehensively like Jesus. More recently, John Mark Comer, um, he, he puts it this way. We need to decide that we will be with Jesus, that we will become like Jesus, and, and, and that we will do what Jesus did. This is what it means to be a disciple, and it is our white-hot focus here as a church. You know this. Uh, we, we are all about being in his word daily. We're about becoming just like Jesus. Every follower can change the trajectory of your life, your family, your influence, your, your workplace, your school, our world, if we just will follow the way of Jesus and recover the original call that he's placed on our lives. Are you a disciple of Jesus? I, I've, I challenge our ministers often. Are you a full-time minister, part-time disciple? Or are you a full-time all-in? I believe the way forward is the way back to the way of Jesus. And so what does this look like? It looks like the cruciform life, the life that looks like Jesus, the cross-shaped life, meaning uh, you can even say it visually. We, we, we respond to his grace. He has come to us. We worship him as we give our lives completely to him. We love him. And then we love others as he's called us to love others just like he loves others. And so it's this, this cruciform life. We die to ourselves. And so what does this look like? It looks like Jesus. And it looks like the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to apply it every week. Again, don't miss, don't miss one, one day. And it's going to be a great time. The, the question is not, um, are you a disciple, frankly? The question is, uh, whose disciple are you? Because we're all being formed spiritually. In, in fact, in this digital age, uh, we are being discipled, spiritually formed on our screens. Every swipe, every click, every post, every search, algorithms are, are hunting you down and telling you then what to buy. It's freaky, is it not? Telling you what you ought to believe, tell you who you ought to be angry at, telling you who you ought to hate. And these things are spiritually forming us. Now, it may surprise you um, that, that Jesus then calls us to love even our enemies. And what do I say surprise? You know that. But to do that is another thing. In our, in our dwell reading this week with Jonah, um, we learned this. It, you, know, it, you, you, you can assume that you've created God in your image if you think he hates the same people you hate. And in a political season, this is worth noting and worth applying. We're going to live differently. Now, it might surprise you that the Sermon on the Mount is likely not one sermon. I don't want to throw you off too much. But yes, this was a historical moment in time, historical place. In fact, a lot of us, Stacy and I, others of you here in the room, have been to this place. We've been to where this sermon was preached. It, it, it was a historical moment. But think about it. Jesus didn't have, you know, a YouTube channel. He didn't, he didn't toss out memes or something on, on TikTok. Um, instead, he would preach um, sermons throughout the area, right? In fact, at the, the end of, uh, of Matthew 4, before it enters into now what we're reading, it says that he went about the, the whole area of Galilee. This is north of the Sea of Galilee is where he is here. And he went about preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. Well, what did he preach? Bam. Matthew says, here's what he preached. Okay. So what we have here, some have described it as, I mean, it's the sermon of all sermons, but some have described it as Jesus' greatest hits is what we have here. Um, this is core. This is the core preaching of the kingdom of God. So let's look at the Beatitudes, all right? As always, underneath the English words, we got Hebrew, we've got Aramaic is the word uh, Jesus, I mean, the language he spoke. But underneath the Greek words, we have other words. And in this case, um, our connect group leaders are going to discover this uh, is, as we even have a training today. Um, the Greek word makarios um, 
And the Hebrew word ashray, help us out here. Um, the word uh, in the Greek is makarios, but ashray is a word that we see like in Psalm 1, it says blessed, that's the word, blessed are those uh, who are planted like a tree. The, the Hebrew word ashray is they are, they're, 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 they're blessed because they're planted by this, this, uh, this living water. Why are they blessed? Well, when drought comes, when difficulty comes, they're going to not just thrive, they're going to flourish because they're planted, right? So, so the, the whole point, Jesus uses this, he's a rabbi, right? He's a Jewish rabbi. And he's saying, he's saying, these people are blessed. So on the one hand, ashray, these people are ashray. Why are they ashray? Because there's another word, baruch uh, in Hebrew is a word that, that is the blessing of God. So he's saying here in the Beatitudes, they're living the good life. They're blessed. Why are they blessed? So the first phrase, the first line, then tells us in the second line why he or they are blessed. So say the first is a posture, identity, and then the second is a movement of God on their lives. Okay, so let's break them down. Here's what we're going to do. Um, don't have a three-point sermon. I've got about 10 points right here. All right, so follow along with me. Blessed are the poor in spirit. I want you to apply this too as we walk through this. Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All right, so blessed are those who know they're in need is what this is about. This is why it's so hard in our culture today. But this literally means blessed are those who are squeezed out. This word um, spirit is the word ruach in the Hebrew. It's a pneuma in the Greek. Blessed are those who feel like they have no air left. You've been squeezed out because you're in a position now to receive, inhale the power, real power that you need. You're in a good place. So if you feel that you have nothing, you're in position now to receive everything is how this works. Verse four, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who've lost much. And I'm looking at members of our church even now who I know have lost much because you're in a position to be comforted by the very presence of God. You're in the best place. Though it doesn't feel like it. None of these people look like they're living the blessed life that Jesus is talking to. And I'd remind you today, death comes in many forms. And for those of us who grieve over the state of the world constantly, this is a reminder. The second point is always this. It points to an eschatological state of a day when uh, it will be true. But he's saying, we bring it now. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who are afflicted humiliated, in this case, those who are socially oppressed, those who feel weak are actually strong because you're relying on the, on the strength of the Lord. In Psalm 37, it speaks of those who trust in Yahweh, they will inherit the land, which is, again, an eschatological kind of pointing to the new earth. The second triad, blessed are those who, are hung, who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled Think about this. A perpetual state of hunger and thirst is something nobody wants to experience. But isn't it true? Let's be honest. Don't we kind of live that way? It's Paul's um, uh, admonition where he says, you know, we're, we're groaning and longing for a different world. Be blessed when you feel that, when you recognize that the only thing that will satisfy you is God himself He's the one who brings satisfaction. This righteousness is a right standing before God and is doing right by others. Completely connected. Doing what is just and right for others. We find ourselves in right relationships. We're pursuing them all the time. And we want others to experience the justice of God. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Now, one's ability, this is like forgiveness, to, to experience the mercy of God, to receive or give it to others, proves that we belong to him because this is what our fathers does. This is what he does. Merciful action proves that you belong to him. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, this cuts to the heart, as so much of this does, to the heart of our motivation. Um, and notice, too, that spiritual vision requires purity of heart. We are only made pure by the pure one. Jesus, the righteous one, who changes our hearts, and we are given pure motives to love others as we should. We, again, we're made for this. This is how we're called to live. And the third triad builds on the first two. He says, get ready for conflict. If you are going to live in this kingdom and live like this, you're going to experience persecution in the world. 
Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who work for and build structures of peace and reconciliation. Those who step into these places where justice needs to be served and reconciliation, bridges need to be built. And I can tell you as one who has sought to lead us in this way in our city, not everybody's going to like that you're doing that or how you're doing it. And we all need to step into this in our own personal places. His light shines brightest in dark places. And he's calling all of us to live this way. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This would be worth talking about. You're persecuted because of righteousness, okay? Not because you're a jerk, all right? That's just um, not because you're just joining the, 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 the vitriol. No, 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 no. That's the problem. We've got to have faith to believe if we really live this out, Jesus is going to show up and it's going to change the game. Because if you step into this, he's saying, if you're going to get caught in the crossfire of people who will be angry and, and will not like what you're doing and will not like how you're doing it. Blessed are you when people insult you persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you he's saying don't be surprised and you'll find yourself in good company but look at this there are rewards spiritual rewards again an act of faith he says celebrate and shout for joy every time we gather in worship Every time you worship the Lord through a very difficult time, it's a militant act, a subversive defiance act before all that's coming at you in the world. Say, I'm going to worship God. This is why our weekly gatherings are so critical. So the Beatitudes is worth memorizing. Uh, it's worth meditating over and over. And you might be thinking today, and I'm going to give us time here to challenge you to make a decision. How do I enroll in this class? The real good life. How do I enroll? How do I sign up? Jesus said in Luke 9, 23, then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple, we've noted recently, he didn't call Christians. He only called disciples. Whoever wants to be my apprentice must deny himself. You deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. If you want to follow the narrow way of Jesus, this is the way. And today what I want to do is really draw a line in the sand. Okay. So we've given some time in the service for this. I want to do this. I want to ask you, have you received Christ by faith? Have you received his finished work on the cross? He took your sins upon the cross, died for you. Have you by faith said yes to him? And you're now in the forever family of God. I want to ask you by show of hands. All right. If we can't testify here, we're not going to testify out there. How many of you, and this may not be everybody. So don't, I'm, I'm just saying, those of you who've received Christ, I want you to raise your hand and say, I have done so. Raise it high. Lord, see me. Here I am. Okay. Now put your hand down because the first step is that. Then Jesus says, you want to be my disciple? He calls us to be baptized. He says, once you become a believer, sorry, not a child, but a believer, perhaps a child old enough to have received Christ, the first step into discipleship is a major move across the line. And it's baptism by immersion. Because you're saying, watch this, I embrace Luke 9.23. Die to myself, watery grave, I'm dead. I'm raised up, totally forgiven, raised up now to live a new life. And I proclaim Jesus is Lord of my life. That is a significant moment in life of a believer. I want to ask you, again, this is now a different crowd, not the same. How many of you have been baptized as a believer? Raise your hand if you have been. Okay, now here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn to the person next to you right now. And I want you to turn to your neighbor and, and I want you to tell them why you were baptized and how it's impacted your life. Okay, so let's do that right now. You don't have a lot of time. Don't go into great detail. But why were you baptized? How has it changed your life?
All right. Second person share if you haven't yet. All right. Testify. Praise the Lord. We could go on and on. I just wanted to, I want you to testify uh, how the Lord has, has, has blessed you. Now, here's the thing. Some of you are here and you don't have that story. Um, you may be a believer and it's like, I've never been baptized. You may uh, want to come to faith in Christ today. We're going to give you an opportunity to do that. We're going to close with a song. And during this song, I'm going to ask you to move. I'm going to ask you to move. I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to come join me. I'm going to move. I'm going to, I'm going to go over to this space right over here, the north apse, this hallway. And uh, I'd love to meet you there. Meet you personally and along with other ministers. If you've not yet been baptized, we have an opportunity coming up on September the 29th. We're going to have our outdoor baptism. And uh, this is a day for you to proclaim Jesus as Lord of your life. You, you, you came here this morning, maybe, well, I didn't know this was happening. Now the Spirit of God is moving. And here's what I've learned. When the Spirit of God is moving, the time to obey is now. Right now. So I'm challenging you, if you've not been baptized, for you to decide today to do so, if you're a believer. And we want to talk to you about that. In fact, you can also um, text this number that you'll see on the screen here in a moment. This, uh, this number, you could write this down if you want to, 74899. Text baptism, baptism, the word baptism, to that number, 74899. And you're going to get a form. You can fill it out. We're going to get back to you. A real person will receive this and we'll get back to you. But you have to go in and if you have any questions, you can go and fill that out and then we'll get back to you, okay? Hey, and we're also going to be, um, this is so exciting, we're going to be in the sanctuary can't wait for November 3rd. You heard that earlier. Um, maybe you want to be baptized on that day. We're going to baptize on that day. So do this. Come find us over here uh, and say, I want to be baptized. And we can help you, you know, whatever, when, when a good time for you is. But maybe you want to do uh, really the outdoor baptism. Come join us sooner than later. It's going to be a glorious time. You can get baptized any Sunday. But we would love to talk to you today. Today is the day of decision. Okay, so let me pray and then we're going to stand. I'm going to ask you to come join me and other ministers over here. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for your words to us today that challenge us. May we live out the Beatitudes, find ourselves in that position and posture. We already are there. So we thank you for the blessing that comes when we find ourselves in those positions. So Lord, move among us now. May your spirit now convict us and may we not leave this place without acting and moving on what you've called us to do. And so we move now because it's Christ in us. Not I, but Christ in me. So we will follow you even now. In Jesus' name, I pray. And everyone said, amen.